At last week's Animal Welfare Conference on campus, we talked with Candace Crony from Purdue University. She's an associate professor in animal behavior and well-being and said in her lecture that what consumers want and what agriculture provides are the same thing. So we asked if that's the case, then where's the discord? What people are asking us to do now, in addition to providing safe, affordable, tasty, very affordable food, I say affordable twice affordable for a reason, right? mm -hmm. um, and food that's always readily accessible, it's there whenever people want it, is they're starting to ask us to produce that food in a way that is respectful of the environment, respectful of the animals that are in there, and of the other people in the chain. Okay, and so animal welfare is the, f the piece that I was focused on um, a little bit more today because what people are telling us is they care about how those animals become food and how they're treated in the process that leads up to that. And one of those parts is, let's just take hogs for example and mm -hmm. stalls, sows in stalls for gestation. And one of the things you said is what we're missing when we talk about fixing that problem is what consumers perceive. Mm -hmm. But isn't there something to be said that they already know, we've already told them multiple times what we're doing to make that different and they just ignore it or don't care about hearing it? I don't know that we've actually done a brilliant job of telling consumers why we keep sows in stalls or why we even develop that form of housing to begin with. I'm not sure the average person has gotten that message. I, I have seen nothing that leads me to believe that the average person knows that. So how do we fail there? Where did we fail? Well, I think it's partly who we're talking to and where we're putting our education and who, who our, our, our target audiences are. And so oftentimes we think, well, if we just put this information on our websites and people will know it, or if, if we go to something, and typically it's an ag event and tell people this, they'll get it. And so if you think about the number of people who are unlikely to go to an ag site or unlikely to go to an agricultural event, that's a pretty large number of people. So we may have the information, but I'm not sure we're really putting it in the hands of the people who are genuinely interested in these areas. And one of the questions asked today was then where is the, where do we go? Yeah, well, I can't give you all of the answers to that, <laughs> but what I can tell you is we, not, we need to start thinking a little bit more creatively, right? So for instance, we've got groups that we partner with. We have, for instance, lots of folks who are interested in companion animals who, instant, who you know, feed their companion animals mm -hmm. um, some of our animal products, right? One of the things that we don't do a really good job of doing is explaining to food companies that produce pet animal foods how we produce our, our animals that are going into their products um, and what we do to ensure the best possible care for them as well. Because, you know, if you are the average person who owns a companion animal and you're reading the labels of the things you're feeding your animals, you might actually get some of that information there and we don't put it there. One of the words you used there was partner. Is yeah. it safe to say that sometimes when we talk about consumer versus producer, mm -hmm. it's more of a battle than a partnership? Absolutely, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I talk about the urban-rural connections, um, because oftentimes we forget that we are completely interdependent on each other. Those of us who live in, in urban and suburban environments need people who give us food, and we oftentimes take them for granted and forget that they're actually mm -hmm. there. Those in the, in, who are dealing with you know, rural production issues who are really just trying to find good ways to put food on the table oftentimes see consumers as, as being you know, problems for them to deal with, with all of these pesky issues they keep raising. We're in a partnership and we have to make it work. You said today the most important thing to take away, animal welfare issues are not about animals, they're about what animals represent. Explain that. Yeah, okay, I'll elaborate a little bit. So animal welfare issues really are about animals, but the truth of the matter is the reason people get so worked up about them and so irate and so emotionally overwrought is because animals have come to represent for many of us really valuable characteristics that oftentimes used to and still you know, are reminiscent of, of important treasured relationships we have or have had with other people. Okay? And so for the person who is really concerned about the sow in a gestation crate, or stall, whichever you prefer, and, and what her quality of life is like in that stall, it probably has more to do with some sort of alliance or understanding of, of what it might be like to be in that position. Okay? And in terms of how that ties back to some of the relationships we talked about, um, if you are the person who has a relationship with any sort of animal that matters to you, that you feel invested in and that you want to protect, then certainly you're more likely to get a little bit upset or at least be more likely to think about what that experience might be like for the sow and then leave thinking that maybe this isn't a, a, the best way to raise sows.